Thank you very much, uh, Raghunandan Rao Garu. It's, uh, you brought out very good points, you know, that uh, each and every one of us can think about and act upon. Next, I would like to introduce uh, somebody. Actually, before I do that, uh, how many of you do not know Dr. Prakash Rauji? All right. So, very, very few, but still, for the benefit of uh, those people, I would like to. <laughs> So, Dr. Prakash Rauji is uh, a resident of Frisco. He is the chairman of uh, Hanuman Temple, which is here in Frisco. But more than that, he is the founder of Global Hindu Heritage Foundation. Global Hindu Heritage Foundation is a non-profit organization that does amazing work, especially when it comes to protecting Hindu lands and Hindu interests back in India. So, all the details are there in this booklet. Uh, if you do not have it, you please uh, take one. And a very brief introduction about um, Prakash Rao Garu. He is that uh, he is a PhD and then he has been a professor for about 30 years. And then after that, you know, if I would have retired, you know, I would have been playing with my grandchildren or something like that. But he took an entirely different cause, which is working towards uh, the Hindu, Hindu society. And he got inspired with one particular incident that happened where the government, the chief minister of Andhra Pradesh in India at that time, he has uh, uh, issued a, a, a rule or geo where, uh, you know, the government lands can be very freely uh, auctioned. So in order to stop that, and, uh, you know, he has taken up, he thought that we need to do something about it, and then he started Global Hindu Heritage Foundation. It's been, I think, about a decade, so a lot has happened. And um, I think that, you know, we should hear from him more about uh, his message to, for us today. Yeah, namaste. I, he already said everything what I wanted to say. So I don't have to say too much about it. But um, anyway, last uh, 10 years, this has been our mission. As you all know, all our Hindu temples are under government control. It is absurd. No country would allow anything like this one. We only, as Hindus, allowing this thing to happen. We are not serious. We don't take it seriously because all the temples are being ruined. Money is looted. Lands are sold. So we don't even pay any attention to what is happening to our culture, our Hinduism. Once we lose the temples, we lose our culture. So we have to pay attention to what is happening. Yet until certain time, probably we did not realize now you have access everywhere, what is happening, you can read each and every day. That is what brought us to Dr. Swami about 11 years ago. So we have been working very closely with him. And uh, there is a case in the Supreme Court. And hopefully within a year or two, Dr. Swami is going to make sure that uh, he, he, we he make sure that the temples are released from the government control. So we, Global Hindu Heritage Foundation has already prepared a rough draft as to how do we manage the temples once they are released from the government control. And Dr. Subramani Swami has a copy of it, so we are revising it. Hopefully, either in January or February, we will have a national conference under the aegis of Dr. Swami. So just only two things I will mention. Satyam Vada, Dharmam Chara. If there is anybody in this universe who follows that one, it is none other than Dr. Swami. Because, <clears throat> because Satyam Vada, he speaks the truth. So that's the reason he is not afraid of anybody. It doesn't matter who it is, what government it is, even though he was being maligned by for 40, 45 years by some Congress party and all that, but he was never been touched by anybody else. And then, dharmacharam. So that means, you see, he wants to practice the righteous life. Righteous, he leads that righteous life. So as a result, these two things, uh, you know, these are the ancient virtues that has passed on from generation to generation to all of us. So I salute actually Dr. Swami for standing up for everything that is, that is Hindu, that is Dharma, that is Satya. 
so i will close this one so i think we will proceed to the next level namaste thank you very much uh, prakash rao garu lot of inspiration from everyone who is here on the dais today next i would also like to introduce um, one of our uh, very very important people from um, hinduism standpoint especially here in dallas uh, sashi kejriwal ji who is here he has done amazing work with respect to supporting the community not just by the lip service but actually providing real encouragement real jobs real work to the people that are needy especially from a bhutanese communities and also for all the causes and temples and other things he has been there as a solid person as a rock to you know help and support so it's a very privilege for me to introduce him to all of you i request him to say a few words about uh, dr swami and uh, have uh, the program started thank you uh, gopal ji namaste hari om everybody uh, my job is to introduce dr swami and if you some of you remember uh, i introduced him a couple of years ago and i promised you the list is so huge of his achievements it will take us many many hours to do that so i obviously can't spend hours but i'll talk about things that i did not talk about last time his list is so huge of his achievements <clears throat> i'll start by disagreeing with my brother here mr reddy he's saying everybody knows dr swami my contention is you may know him but you don't realize how great he is everybody has bits and pieces of his achievements but if you put everything in a collage you'll be amazed at what kind of hero will come out of that let me give you a few examples how many of you follow football american football so you know there's a quarterback right and will the quarterback be able to do anything without a good offensive line he won't be able to do anything right so similarly you you saw the election that happened with trump right who 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 do you think paved the way for trump to win the election Do you have you heard the name Julian Assange and WikiLeaks? Without him advertising all the crap that Mrs. Clinton did, do you think Trump stood a chance? No, right? So people don't realize who's really behind some important events in life. Well, similarly, my contention is that you would not have Narendra Modi as president today, uh, as prime minister today, if Dr. Swami had not made everybody in India realize how corrupt the Gandhi family is. we heard so much about sonia that i felt like saying dr swami stop everybody is convinced by now that she is a crook so he 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 gets a lot of kudos for that uh, against sonia gandhi he has a uh, he has exposed uh, her national herald uh, corruption case where she land grabbed 310 million dollars worth of land uh, hundreds of millions of uh, dollars and rupees that she uh, is known to have taken in the augusta westland chopper scam her citizenship fraud claiming that she's an indian citizen he exposed that then her degree in oxford he exposed that single handedly her birthplace she wanted to hide her nazi and her fascist mussolini connections so she lied about her birthplace he exposed that okay her dad was by the way uh, you know a spy of the kgb and and all that stuff so her husband killers I mean god knows what role she had in her getting her husband killed but she was sympathizing with them she got them out of jail and she fought very hard to keep them out of trouble imagine a woman getting her husband skillers out of trouble uh he has pointed out in one article uh in 2010 that he wrote that says do you know your sonia in which he's mentioned that mysteriously anybody that was in her path to power starting with sanjay gandhi indira gandhi rajiv gandhi uh, rajesh pilot madhurav sindhya jitendra prashad and a bunch of others they mysteriously all died just because a plane took off from delhi without any fuel in it with sanjay gandhi in it what are the odds of that happening without somebody you know behind pulling the strings behind the scene so he has done a lot single handedly just to finish off the gandhi family then of course for our mandirs he's fought so much he's exposed uh, the ram mandir the you know he's exposed uh all the problems uh, with the rulings by the government about the ram mandir and he's fought very hard for all the 400 mandirs that are under occupation by mosques today in particular he worked very hard for the nataraja temple in chidambaram in tamil nadu in 2014 he successfully went to the supreme court to get the possession of this temple back to back to its rightful community of the dikshitars in in tamil nadu so that was a huge achievement by itself if we had done just that one thing we would be a hero in tamil nadu he has done hundreds of such things uh, he had he has fought very hard for the common civil code against the article 370 
He has exposed so many scams. Maybe the Modi government has, does have crooks, but they're afraid he'll catch them, so they've not done any scams lately. Who knows? Uh, he has uh, exposed the NDTV money laundering scam. The Ratan Ta he's exposed Ratan Tata. He's exposed the 2G spectrum, which involved really literally billions of uh, US dollars. Uh, he has formed a committee called uh, ACACI, which is the Action Committee Against Corruption in India. Uh, he went and claimed that these electronic voting machines are fraudulent. The election commission at first laughed at him, and then uh, eventually he went to the Supreme Court and he got a paper trail implemented for the voting machines. So he, he knew what was going on, and thank, maybe, maybe that's why uh, there was fair elections, who knows. Uh, in the 1980s, he, he did not start this in the 90s. In the 80s, uh, he exposed a very famous uh, phone tapping case in Karnataka because of which the chief minister had to resign in Karnataka. Uh, lately, uh, my, my, my personal favorite is uh, I don't like to see foreign powers controlling India. You know, India should be left on its own. And the, the people that he kicked out of there in our Reserve Bank and our Finance Ministry, because he realized that very few Indians realized that they're really installed there by the foreign powers. They were acting in foreign interests. That was one of his big achievements that people don't realize and understand. Uh, he exposed the PK movie and uh, he showed people the uh, pictures of Pakistan TV sponsoring uh, Amir Khan's, uh, you know, his movie and his links to uh, uh, terror funding in Pakistan. Uh, he was the first one to normalize links with Israel. In 1982, he visited Israel and because of that, <laughs> India, for the first time, India had embassies and vice versa with Israel in 1992 all because of his effort and his foresight in doing that. He's also a big proponent of normalizing relations with China and working with them. Uh, he has fought against illegal conversions in India, and he's tried to get laws implemented, which is very difficult to do, you realize that. The, the evangelical lobby is, uh, is very uh, smart and very powerful. So I'd like to end by saying a few things, and if you agree, then I want you to loudly say yes together. We're going to make this interactive, okay? I'm going to conclude with a few sentences about him that are the highlights of his achievements. <laughs> and except for that one uh, uh, nexus, uh, you know, uh, uh, evangelist, uh, leftist, uh, nationalist guy that's probably there, there's always one at these meetings. Everybody else that agrees with me, say yes if you agree with what I'm saying, okay? He is the best prime minister India has never had. He is not your typical politician because he has a conscience. Yes. His intelligent, and I'm quoting Rajiv Malhotra ji here, his intelligence, persistence, and pursuit of truth makes him the most important intellectual Kshatriya of our times. Yes. He has shown Hindus the path to self-respect, to our unity, and to pride in our Hindu name. He's done all this while risking, many of you may not know, there's so many threats to his life constantly by so many people that hate him, that he's exposed, that he's doing all of this in spite of threats to his life. Yes. We, people in Dallas, salute to a real life, real life hero who's in our midst. Thank you, welcome to Dallas. So at this time, I think you say with a um, round of applause, let us welcome Dr. Swami to speak. Thank you very much. Um, <coughs> uh, distinguished uh, leaders of the community on the dais and friends who on a weekday, despite the rain, have turned up in full strength. Uh, I've been asked to speak on what legal, legal battles uh, uh, National Herald uh, and uh, uh, Ayodhya, as well as uh, Chidambaram's imminent uh, journey to jail.
sons. Now, first of all, uh, I'm not a lawyer. My wife is a lawyer, but I'm not a lawyer. I've been a professor of economics. But uh, over the years, I began to learn law because every time I said something, some lawyer on behalf of some politician would file a defamation case against me. <laughs> and then I found that uh, hiring a lawyer to defend me was very expensive. So therefore, I decided I will argue myself. That's how the process started. And I must tell you, there must have been over my last 30, 40 years, at least uh, 30 defamation cases filed against me. And I won all of them. <laughs> and for the last uh, 25 years, uh, no, last 12, 15 years, not a single defamation case has been filed against me because the defamation of the person starts when I start cross-examining him in court. <laughs> so people are afraid now to file defamation cases against me. And uh, this is, for me, a recognition that law is the modern weapon in a democracy and that everybody should learn law and uh, so that they know their rights and they know how to defend their rights. The question of public interest litigation uh, attracted my interest. Uh, when I first uh, filed a case against Ramkrishna Ikde on the way the Bangalore land was being allocated on a basis of favoritism. Now, you can't just go and file a PIL, as very often I get on Twitter, why don't you file a PIL on this, why don't you file a PIL? You can't just go and file a PIL. You can file a PIL under a violation of your fundamental rights. So the first thing you have to show is that somewhere your fundamental rights have been infringed and therefore you want the court to intervene. The second thing you have to show is that you exhausted all other possibilities. You went to the government, you went to the corporation, whatever. And then you came to the court. And both these have to be shown. That's why I have a track record of, all my, I think, 100%. All my PILs have been upheld by the Supreme Court. And I've got judgments uh, which are all over the uh, Supreme Court and uh, High Court uh, journals. And therefore, I began thinking of these uh, issues on which, public issues in which I should continue to file public interest litigation. Right now, there are some very uh, important ones pending, which I'll tell you in a minute. But it's of great importance in politics to demonstrate that you can file, fight for justice. And uh, when the 20, 2014 elections were coming, at that time, uh, Narendra Modi was nominated, I think, in the end of 2013 to be our prime ministerial candidate. And our party president was Rajnath Singh. And both of them decided that a committee should be set up, committee for strategic action against, uh, for Lok Sabha elections of 2014. And I was made chairman of that. And as a chairman, I had to identify how we can achieve majority. And I came to the conclusion that we need three basic elements for getting a majority. And no party had got majority the previous 33 years. So it was a, unbelievable that we can plan for absolute majority. So I identified governance anti-corruption campaign, and third is Hindutva. Now, governance, of course, uh, Modi had already made a name by his experiment in Gujarat, so it was easy. But I also knew one thing, that governance, if bad governance is there, you can lose an election. 
but if there is a if it's good governance then it is not necessary that you will win the election so when i studied the previous elections that's what i found moraji desai gave one of the finest uh, governance in the two and a half years we were in power as janata party government prices were brought to record lows you could buy 1 kilo of sugar for 2 rupees that sort of thing but when the elections came we were thrashed and mrs gandhi returned back to power the next example of great governance in fact revolutionary governance i would say is pv narsimha rao's tenure and at that time i was also had ministerial rank position in charge of the international trade aspects of gat and uh, narsimha rao transformed the economy from a socialist controlled economy to a market economy and the growth rate rose from 3.5% to 8% in just 5 years but when the elections took place narsimha rao lost the election badly that is his party and their strength came down to half similarly when atal bihari vajpayee was prime minister everybody thought he was doing very excellent governance but then when the results came out in 2004 his uh, the bjp strength also went down to half so and this has happened in many other places in andhra uh, after a great deal of reform activity that uh, uh, chandrababu naidu did he lost the elections krishna in uh, karnataka lost the elections so the question became to me that if governance is a necessary condition for victory but not sufficient in other words just governance is not enough you need something more and that's how i came across that fighting corruption is an important part of course i was already fighting corruption earlier the 2g had come much before the election the 2g spectrum can a scam case but i made it as a plank of the party and hindutva was necessary for getting majority because i found studying the congress strategy was to divide the hindu vote on caste region language and break up the hindu vote in in as many ways as possible and after all hindus are 80 Two percent, including Sikhs, Buddhists, and Jains, we are 82 percent of the population. So, in order for the Congress to win, they have devised the strategy: divide the Hindu votes and unite the minority votes. So, at that stage, I felt, of course, I was for Hindutva. Hindutva means Hindu ness. It doesn't mean any religion. and muslims can also have hindutva because after all their ancestors were hindus and that is proved by uh, the dna studies now which show that hindus and muslims have the same dna which means the muslims of today in india are converts i mean their and so their parents and grandparents generation were converts they didn't come from saudi arabia or some place like that and they were not children of gauri and ghazni but unfortunately we have not been able to educate the muslims or if they are educated and accept it they don't have the guts to say it because the mullahs might do something bad to them so they keep quiet on it but the fact of the matter is that hindutva is a way of life we are different from other country world or societies in way we treat our parents the way husband behaves with his wife and wife behaves with husband father behaves with his daughter and the mother behaves with the son uh, all we have so many what this called as sanskars and these sanskars are different for example we look after our old age parents in india but not in the west and uh, we we tend to adulate people who make sacrifice whereas in the western societies if you have made a lot of wealth you have certain status in society and that's why a man like mahatma gandhi who only want a piece of cloth you know and uh, what 
in brief is called a Langoti, he led the country. In the United States, you cannot have a man dressed like Mahatma Gandhi and lead the American people. He has to have a suit, tie, boot, shining shoes. And therefore, there is a fundamental difference. How we regard, why we worshipped Mahatma Gandhi when, after all, he was educated in England, he was a barrister. He could have been in tie and uh, coat and uh, shoe, shoe, shining shoes. But because he also recognized that the Indians worship sacrifice. And therefore, sacrifice and learning is the highest pedestal for the Hindu. So therefore, I felt that Hindutva should be emphasized in order to make people not vote on caste basis, but on the question of Hindu values. And we found a lot of support for that. And BJP's vote went from 21%, the maximum ever, to 31%. And with the NDA allies, we went to 38%. And we got absolute majority. So in all this establishment of Hindutva and uh, anti-corruption, PILs came very useful as a way of awakening the people. So it is in that context that the issues that uh, have been highlighted have been uh, done. Now, when I went in a PIL, i give you an example. All the Shankaracharyas together filed a petition along with prominent sadhus like Dayanand and Saraswati, Pejavar, Mat Swami, etc. in the Supreme Court to say that Rama Setu should not be destroyed, which was a game plan of the Congress, or rather the UPA, to cut a canal through Park Strait and uh, Gulf of Mannar and cut through Rama Setu and break some Rama Setu into two in order to establish a ship channel. It was called the Setu Samudram uh, project. And because ships have to go around, uh, have to go around uh, uh, Sri Lanka to reach from, to, uh, from Kanyakumari to Chennai. You can't go straight through because Rama Setu is there in, uh, in the, from the Indian coast of Rameshwaram to, uh, to uh, up to uh, Sri Lanka. So therefore, they, they, kept, they gave this, uh, they came up with this project. And of course, uh, Karna Nidhi was playing it up as a way of teaching northerners a lesson for demolishing Babri Masjid. He said, he told the Muslim audiences, they demolished Babri Masjid, I will demolish Rama Setu. Well, he got demolished in the end, not the Ram Setu, because after these uh, sadhus, sannyasis, petitions were for the Supreme Court, and said this is our religious thing and you know, you can't, you can't allow it, the court rejected their petition. So they went in a, a, a review appeal, and the courts then passed strictures against the sadhus and sannyasis, saying that you have come with a mischievous. And the blowing up with the RDX of the Rama Setu was decided. And they had only one week. At that time, the RSS chief Sudarshan and the VHP chief uh, uh, Ashok Singhal, they came to my residence and said, you must now do something, stop it. It will be a great insult to Hindus if you do that. Now, how do I go in a PIL after the great sadhu sannyasis PI has been rejected, not once but twice. So I said, you have come to me at a very late stage. They said, no, no, whatever it is, you have to find a way. So I had to think of a way of devising a PIL which uh, will make the Supreme Court listen to me. So I devised it this way, that Setu Samadham project is to enable uh, to travel for, uh, f uh, for goods and passengers to travel from Kanyagumari to, uh, uh, to um, uh, Chennai without having to go around Sri Lanka, that is uh, for shipping. So I said that is fine. 
and this project is costing 3,000 crores. But if your goal is to move your freight, shipping freight, the ships come from Europe, they come from Africa and all that, uh, in a s efficient way from Kanyakumari to Chennai. Then there's an alternative way of doing it, and that is build a railway line, I mean convert Tuti Korin into a, sh a container port, and then build a railway line from Tuti Korin Harbor to Chennai. And I showed the cost of, uh, of that is 600 crores only, whereas the ship channel thing is, uh, uh, is worth 3,000 crores. So I said public money is being wasted. So my <laughs> so my petition had to be accepted because I had a public interest in saving public money. And the court admitted my petition, decided to hear it. Of course, he had a battle royal for two years. I had to argue the matter because they fiercely resisted by senior counsels like Fali Nariman and others on behalf of the Congress government. And sometimes the judges also used to get a little exasperated. They said one day to me, Mr. Swami, you want to say that Ram Setu you know, is worship, worshipful? Who will go in the middle of the ocean to do puja to Ram Setu? So I said, your, your Lordship, every morning I do puja to Surya Bhagwan, but I don't go to the sun and come back. <laughs> So argument after argument we overcame and finally uh, the court agreed with me and we, they told the government that in this present form we will not accept and this say to some of them project is to be scrapped. And now what I am waiting for is the gov our government to declare Rama Setu as a national heritage monument so that So that you can walk from Rameshwaram to Sri Lanka. The former of, of, of uh, the previous president of Sri Lanka, Rajapaksha, he was a good friend of mine. And when I told him that he should also say that uh, Ramayana is a my tradition and our tradition and you cannot break Rama Setu, which he did and he wrote a letter to the then Prime Minister Manmohan Singh. But he then renovated, updated uh, Ashok Vatika, Ravan's palace, and so on. I spent a lot, and the Sanjeevana mountain, which uh, Hanuman had brought, it's there. You can see a mountain with Himalayan uh, plants on the, on, the, on, the, on the mountain. And it looks like as if, in fact, Hanuman had brought it, and for, probably he did. But uh, he did all this, and I said, why are you doing all this uh, renovation? He said, because I know you're going to win this case, and therefore tourists from India will start coming, so I'm preparing for that. <laughs> I hope it will be possible very soon for tourists of India to walk across Rama Setu and go to Sri Lanka and see where Sita stayed in Ashok Vatika, and et cetera, et cetera. So I'm here telling you the way I found this to be done. Same thing with the, um, uh, uh, Kejriwalji mentioned about the uh, uh, Sabanayaka temple, which is popularly known as the Nataraj temple, which uh, Karnanidhi government grabbed and made it its part. Now, see, under Article 25 of our constitution, government can take over temples if there is proved financial mismanagement. They cannot take over how the puja will be conducted and all that. But what was the practice is once you take it over, these pujaris didn't know any law. So these bureaucrats who took it over as administrators, they started bossing around. And very often you had to go to court to rectify this because these poor pujaris used to come to me. For example, in Andhra, uh, in uh, Tirupati, suddenly the uh, government uh, appointed 
a board of governors or trustees or whatever it's called. Uh, there was a chairman called Adi Kesavalu. Adi Kesavalu. So he, um, he said that his dream is to now convert Tirupati into a gold-plated, golden temple. Now, I, I, since his background was not very was shady, uh, he was appointed on political reason. I think he has something to do with the gold uh, uh, trade or something, <laughs> which he wanted to have it under the cover of uh, Tirupati. So I uh, called him up. I said, how are you doing this? He said, no, no, the board has cleared it. So I said, board cannot clear it. You are only allowed to go into the financial irregularities. But you are now making the, uh, altering the temple that only can to be done according to Agama Shastras. And there are Agama Shastris in, uh, in uh, Tirupati and they are all upset about it. So he said, no, 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 I have the power. So I went to the court, now saying that my fundamental rights under Article 25, which is the right to worship, is being altered because I found out that they were going to cover all the walls of Tirupati with gold. Now, the walls of Tirupati temple have got all kinds of carvings, writings on it. How Naivedyam should be prepared, etc. I told Adi Keshavalu, you will put cover this all up. He said, no, no, I have taken a video. And that will be put in a museum, so if you want to see that, you can go to the museum. Then I said, for Archana also, you take a video and put it there. Why go there? <laughs> That's not an argument. And then to hang this, uh, stick the uh, gold plates, they were b planning to bore holes into the wall. So all this I brought to the court's notice, saying that they have no right to get into all this, only financial mismanagement. And then the court upheld it, and uh, the, uh, the order was cancelled, and the adhikashir was very, very unhappy was in tears uh, because I think he was, his heart was placed in that project for some reason. Anyway, he died soon after. <laughs> Those who mess around with the Tirupati, like Vyasar, Adi Keshwalu, they meet their end very quickly. So anyway, this is, <laughs> this is an example. Then I thought about this. When did Tirupati, when was Tirupati temple over, taken over by the government? 1933. And today is what, 2017, which means what, 84 years. 84 years ago, Tirupati was taken over by the government. Now, is it the business of the government to run temples? Even financially, say. So, I began thinking about this. And uh, of course, I found that no madrasa has been taken over, no masjid has been taken over, no church has been taken over. And I once mentioned this to the Supreme Court judge while arguing another matter. And they said, we never said you cannot take over. Ask your government to take it over. And I'm happy now Aditya Nath has taken over uh, madrasas with the beginning. The law doesn't say take over Hindu temples, it says take over religious institutions. So, is a mal malfunctioning or the money is not being properly spent of churches or, or uh, madrasas or uh, mosques, uh, mosque committees, then uh, the government can take over. But can't take over for 83 years or 85, 84 years, you see. So, I, I got this opportunity when this Sabanayagar Nataraja temple in the town of Chidambaram, the, that matter came up. I went to court and argued that the government has taken over without following the due process of determining uh, whether the Savanayaga temple had been mismanaged financially or not. And the court upheld it. But in the course of that, I argued that government's business is not to run a temple. So if there's a financial mismanagement, then the government should 
rectify that and within a period of three years, complete the work and return it back to the trustees. So the court has upheld that and said, you cannot take over any temple for an indefinite period. You know what that means? <laughs> Today, four lakh temples are under government control for years and years. And so if I go to court and say, Tirupati should have...